absolute evidence that you should never buy a car with a CVT. In 2013, we set the cannonball record, and in 2014, I got to know John Ficarra, the organizer of an event called the 2904, a $1 per mile cannonball style race from New York to LA. Cheap cars going not very fast, but it was a ton of fun, and I entered his 2015 event, won that, in a 12 owner, two accidents, salvage title, Mercedes S55 AMG. But over the next few years, as John and I became very good friends, obviously he's been here to tell a lot of amazing stories, we always talked about what are the best possible cars for this type of thing. And that's a very different calculation than an all out cannonball effort, usually a big horsepower AMG car, obviously to try to go as fast as possible. In this, you're trying to have fun, be comfortable, do something funky. And we identified that the perfect car for this type of drive was one of 12 1985 Audi 4000S Quattros that Brock Yates had sort of commissioned and done a special package on with special seats and wheels and things like that to make them cannonball ready with Brumos Audi in Jacksonville. And six of them had been sold through the Jacksonville dealership and six actually in Atlanta. So we were on the hunt for them and I've told many stories about the one that I found. I bought one that had been sitting for 19 years in Lansing, Michigan. And as he and I were researching these cars, he obviously being a much better car historian than I am, we figured out that it looks like there's only two of them that have survived. Number one, which was mine, but also number 11. And as I found some discussion between the two owners years prior on the internet, I eventually did get in touch with both of them. And while mine was a salvage title car and it had been sitting and we had to resurrect it over several years, the other one had really been almost daily driven since new. It was sold in Atlanta, but it was owned by a guy in Seattle. And in talking to him, he actually went to college here in Atlanta at Georgia Tech with my mother. They had known each other a little bit, but he was now an architect in Seattle and he loved the car and he really didn't have any interest in parting with it. Now, unfortunately, last year he passed away and his widow called me and she said, you know, nobody in the family is really excited to keep this car, but we know that you and he had talked about somehow you buying it or whatever. Do you want the car? And I said, well, to be quite honest, ma'am, I already have have one. I've spent a lot of money trying to make it run. It doesn't run all that well right now. I'm not super excited to have another one, but yes, one of us will buy it. I hope it's not me, but if it has to be, you will be relieved of the car very, very quickly. So of course, my first call is to John Ficarra. He buys it quickly, is super excited, owns a much better example of it than mine. Unfortunately, he had said he was done running the 2904. He'd run it for 10 years and was just kind of done with that chapter of his life in terms of organizing such madness. Similarly, Ben Charlie Safari Wilson, who had organized the C2C Express, a similar $3,000 coast to coast and period correct cars race or whatever you'd want to call it. He was done doing that. So there wasn't a great venue to use this Audi which meant that John had to create another one. Therefore, the musket ball was created. And it seemed like the perfect way to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first competitive cannonball, which was run on November 15th, 1971. And so John decided that we would race from Good Wives rather than from the Red Ball. That was where they started in 1979, but it's a giant parking lot. It makes things a lot easier logistically. You can stay at regular hotels with parking lots and things like that. So we were gonna start from Good Wives on the 15th and drive to the Portofino. But in order to make this the perfect event for his Audi and probably for mine as well, he decided that the whole field had to be capped at 100 wheel horsepower. Obviously that was also gonna limit the speed, limit the craziness and make it a jolly good time. But there was gonna be one additional wrinkle that made me particularly excited about participating. And that was a shotgun start. Now, there's never been a competitive cannonball where everybody just started at the same time. Usually everybody was spread out by 10 or 15, maybe even 30 minutes to avoid the obvious congestion of possibly perceived to be racing cars in the first few states as they're all clumped together. If everybody is spaced out, it doesn't necessarily look that bad to law enforcement or other motorists on the road. But if everybody is in cars that are gonna struggle to hit the speed limit anyway, this seems like a great time. And so that experience was honestly what attracted me most to it. Now it was, of course, also the perfect venue for my Audi, which I had not really touched since Arnie Toman, Alex Roy, and myself drove it across in one of the C2C Express events. And so it was thousands of dollars and probably 100 or 200 hours away from being ready to go. But Travis Bell asked if I wanted to go and if I wanted to take it, and I said, you know, sure, why not? 
Now, a couple of months ago, I listed all of my cars for sale because one of my Holy Grail cars became a little bit more of a realistic possibility in terms of its availability, and I needed to have some better liquidity in case that happened. And that is still an ongoing thing, but I'll update everybody on that rather soon. But I listed the Audi amongst all the other cars for sale, not at a crazy low price, but not at something excessive. Because again, I knew that whoever bought it, if they did, was still gonna have to spend some money making it run. And I figured nobody's gonna buy this thing unless they love Cannonball as much as I do. And if they they did, I probably already know them and they would have already asked. So I thought the car was safe to stay in the museum where it's set by the CL55 and the S55 from the 2015-2904 up in North Georgia. But regardless, it did sell. And I was a little bit shocked, but I was very, very excited because it went to a multi-year, I think nine-time veteran of the One Lap of America. The continuation Cannonball event that started in 1985 by Brock Yates while still at Car and Driver and is still run by his son, Brock Yates Jr. And it's always been on my bucket list to do so. And the guy who bought it, even though he has much faster cars, obviously, is going to run it next year in One Lap. And he asked me if I would go with him. And so I am super excited to do that. We will not win, we will not be competitive, but we will have a wonderful time as all. Always. And so what that meant was I no longer had a car for musket ball, which was really exciting because it meant we could rent something because it is, as preposterous as it seems, still possible to rent a brand new car with less than 100 horsepower. So Travis and I start shopping amongst the options, looking at LaGuardia and White Plains, the airports in the New York area that you might fly into in order to go to the start looking for a one-way rental so we could ditch it at LAX and fly right home, never worry about it again. It seemed like the perfect recipe for a worry-free cannonball. And there were a lot of very attractive rates for one-way rentals into California, because I can only assume that over the past couple of years, there have been a lot of one-way rentals out of California. Now, the problem with renting a car is you never know exactly which one you're going to get. If you book something, you're always booking that or similar. And as we all know, when you get to the counter, they almost always offer you an upgrade, which we, of course, couldn't have. Now we had booked a Hyundai Accent, which has 120 crank horsepower. The most logical car would have been a Chevy Spark because it has right at 100 crank horsepower, but anticipating some driveline loss and with an allowance of 100 wheel horsepower, we wanted every horsepower we were allowed to take with us. And so starting at 120 seemed like it would make sense. Now in most cases, you can't talk to the actual counter at the airport where you're gonna show up. You're booking through a national office, especially if you want a cross-country one-way rental. So we had tried to confirm that it would actually be a Hyundai Accent, but we were struggling a little bit with that. To make things even harder, another Ghostbusters movie was released the week before Musket Ball, and Travis Bell is the only human being on Earth that could possibly have his travel plans interrupted by such a phenomenon. But since he is the manufacturer of all kinds of celebrity license plates that he sells on his website. He had to make a bunch of Ecto-1 or Ecto-21 or whatever. There, there was an excess order that had just come in that meant that he was gonna have to drive to Louisiana and then Tennessee and then back to Indiana or whatever in order to satisfy this huge order. It meant that he could not come. Now, Christopher Michaels, who you'll recognize as a Vinwiki storyteller, had asked if I had another seat available. At that point, I did, and so he decided to come on. We wanted a third, and we ended up getting Dan Doucette, who had sort of run logistics for Arnie and Doug's last Cannonball record. He was watching traffic cams and organizing their spotter network and sort of being mission control remotely from Ohio, and he'd always wanted to do one of these types of drives, and so Doug asked if he could come along, and I said, Absolutely, that sounds great. And so the three of us were going to make our way to New York, Christopher and I obviously flying from Atlanta. And I told Christopher, like, see if you can actually get in touch with somebody at the desk. He talked to a nice young lady named Sunshine and she assured him that they did have Hyundai accents and that it would not be a problem for us to drive away in one. So we fly up there, very excited to start this absolutely crazy adventure and we get to the dollar rental car counter and they tell us that they don't have any Hyundai accents. They don't have anything with relatively low horsepower. In fact, the only thing they had was a 2020 Toyota Corolla LE, which should have had about 138 crank horsepower. So anticipating 15 to 20% drivetrain loss to get to the wheels, we were still gonna be considerably over. And John had talked about various penalties that would be levied in the event that you exceeded 100 horsepower and the start party was at a dyno shop. So we were gonna to go to the shop in Connecticut and a dyno any of the cars that sort of seemed suspicious. Now, if we showed up in a car that you could easily Google as having 138 horsepower, we were certainly going to be checked. And so Christopher and I were talking like, can we pull a spark plug? Like, what can we do to make sure that this car only has 100 horsepower? Because we certainly weren't looking to cheat. Now, it was really the 
only option. We looked at every other rental car counter and no one had anything. We started thinking about going over to LaGuardia, but again, you couldn't get in touch with anybody at any of the offices. It would have just been a three hour excursion to maybe or maybe not find a car. So we just decided we've got to do it and we'll just try to find a way to make this car slower. So as we're driving, we start Googling around, looking at forums and things like that. And we learn that this thing has a CVT transmission, a continuously variable transmission, which apparently adds about another 8% to what you'd already anticipate for an automatic transmission drivetrain loss. So that might put it in 25, 28, something like that. But still we were looking at being over a hundred. So anticipating some kind of a penalty, we head over to the dyno shop and we see the amazing array of cars, everything from K cars to TDI everythings to Priuses and old Saturns and everything you might imagine. Only a couple of rental cars, ours and a Chevy Spark. And it's a great time. It's good to kind of see everybody that's in this community because when we all heard about this idea, pretty much everybody who you've seen tell cannonball related stories was there. So it was a great time. The guy who had bought my Audi actually came out in his Lotus Elise and met us at the start. It was great to see him again a couple of weeks after he had road tripped home pretty successfully in the Audi. And so we're all getting started. Now we do dyno the car and I'm honestly pretty nervous about this. I don't want to be cheating in this. I, there's ways you cheat and there's ways you don't and bringing a car that has too much horsepower to a limited cannibal race seems like real cheating. So uh, whatever, I'm, we put it on there and honestly, it's hard to dyno a car with a CVT because as it goes up, it moves a thing down the cone or whatever. And so the horsepower was all over the place, peaking at like 118 wheel horsepower, but it was only momentarily kind of as the transmission is slipping. And so it looked like in reality, it was 90 horsepower. So we agreed that we hadn't cheated. 31% drivetrain loss on this car. Unbelievable, uh, absolute evidence that you should never buy a car with a CVT, but we were in, we were good. And so the next morning we all head off and have an absolutely fantastic time. I live streamed from the start. I'll put a link to that in the description if you wanna check that out further. But we have an awesome time because usually when you do one of these races, even if there's 25, 30 cars, you're probably only gonna see two or three of them along the 2,800 miles or so that it takes to get across the country. In this case, we saw all of them because we all left at the same time. And in general, you'd kind of settle in to a couple of different cars that had about the same top speed. In the case of our car, it was hitting kind of a transmission limiter where it would start to slip and be all over the place against its red line right at 108 miles an hour. Now, we didn't care how long this car lasted. The only thing we were a little bit worried about was the no-name tires with a 106 mile an hour limit on them. But regardless, we pushed it pretty hard and we drove 108 miles an hour whenever that seemed safe to do, which was most of the time. Now, the coolest car there was a Citroen XM. Gorgeous thing, super special, super awesome. Also, didn't have more than 100 horsepower, but it would go a little bit higher due to better aerodynamics than our car would. Now, ours would accelerate better. It was a more modern car, and it, obviously it doesn't have gears, so it can usually find a pretty good way to accelerate. And so we would accelerate up to 108, then they might go 120, and so it was back and forth the whole time. So we were with them for about a 1,000 total miles. We saw a lot of other cars, and it was a whole lot of fun. Unfortunately, Mr. Michaels got a ticket because somebody in a TDI had successfully talked their way out of one based on a fake organ transplant transport situation that I certainly can applaud. But once we got pulled over soon after that, they realized that they'd been had. So they gave Christopher a ticket in Missouri, which one of our ticket sponsors will soon be hopping on to help him fight. And we continued on our way. And we stayed fairly close to the Citroen because they had been stopped in the same sort of speed trap. And so again, we're just neck and neck almost all the way. Now, the most interesting thing happened when we were about 650 miles from the Portofino because we knew that even though the car was supposed to get 42 miles per gallon, the way we were driving it, it was getting about 17. And so we knew that we were gonna have to have two more fuel stops, but after the second one, we had about 250 miles to go and it was showing about 240 miles of range. Now, in each fuel stop up to that point, we'd been leaving a gallon or a gallon and a half of fuel in, not running it all the way to empty because you never know exactly when the next fuel station is going to show up. So we thought there was a chance we could limit it to no more fuel stops and make it. But as I was driving, we were pushing it pretty hard and that deficit became 30 miles, 50 miles, 75 miles. And so when we had about 225 miles to go, we had about 150 miles worth of range and I knew we weren't gonna be able to stretch that. But I also knew that since we were still neck and neck with the Citroen, if we wanted to beat them, knowing that there were still some cars ahead of us that we were never gonna to touch, we probably wanted to go ahead and stop to keep them from pushing too hard. So I pull off, they continue along and slow down just a little bit and we can see each other on tracking apps and stuff like that. And I top the car off seven or eight gallons worth of fuel at that point. As I pull back onto the highway, 
Someone, who I presume is one of you, is filming me on their phone. So I see a fairly new Kia right behind me with somebody leaning on the dash with a phone and I can see that they're filming me. This is pretty cool. So I decide, well, I'm gonna go as fast as I possibly can, which is about 108 miles an hour. And their car obviously has more than 100 horsepower. They're easily keeping up with me, but I start to get KA blips on our radar detector. So right behind us, we're getting it and it's intensifying, which means there is a cop driving in your direction catching up. So he's going pretty fast as well, but I know that he can't see me because there's another car right behind me. So I start moving as I can through the tractor trailers and things like that. And eventually this SUV cop pulls up and he's right there. And I pull in between two tractor trailers and he pulls over the Kia. So if you're the fan that got a ticket to keep us from getting a ticket, I owe you some shirts, some swag, a speed limit sign, something like that. So please contact me and let me know if it was you in the Kia and accept our sincerest gratitude and appreciation. So we continue along and literally as we exit into Redondo Beach, the Citroen's right there. So I pull up, probably bump his fender, maybe. And then I continue right along. They're neck and neck with us through the next couple of turns, but then we go the more direct way into the Portofino. They continue along Catalina. So we're going as fast as we possibly can. We get stuck behind another cop and I had not called any California cop friends. And so we, we get in there as fast as we possibly can. And about two minutes later, the Citroen comes in. So we got fourth, they got fifth. We were the fastest car to not have a fuel cell. And we had an absolute blast, a total time of 33 hours and 35 minutes. And so that begins a couple of days of some great parties at the Portofino, just having a great time sort of celebrating what we found in friendships in this community of cannonball enthusiasts. So John made it across in his Audi much more successfully than I had done in mine a couple of years prior. And it was so, so satisfying and so, so terrific just to see everybody make it there and celebrate their own journeys because you never know what to expect when you drive across the country, but it's always a new adventure and it's always a blast. And I had stood atop the dumpster at the Good Wives Shopping Center in Darien, Connecticut, next to John Ficara, and actually prayed for safety for all of us in our journeys across the country because you never know what's going to happen. But fortunately, everyone had made it safely. Everybody made it eventually, even though some people obviously had breakdowns and things like that. And John Ficara had organized another amazing event in the musket ball. And as I stood up there after I prayed, I told everybody that the most important thing, obviously, is to maintain the immaculate safety record that the pursuit of this hobby has had over now the last 50 years. But I also said that the most important thing that you remember is that you don't need a good time to have a great time. And everybody abided by that. We all had a blast. And so ends another amazing cannonball adventure. We'd like to thank Auto Tempest for their support of this month's videos on VinWiki. Auto Tempest is the best place to find your next car. Whether it's your dream car or your next project, anything you want to look for, it's the most powerful tool to search all the major listing sites at the same time. They give you much more specific search criteria. They are the supporter of Car Trek, and we cannot thank them enough for that. But this is now their fourth year of sponsoring the VinWiki channel. So be sure to thank them now by checking out the link in the description below to search for your next car. Autotempest.com, all the cars, one search.